The Tuskegee study I discussed earlier led to the formation of ethical guidelines for reviewing research proposals. Institutional review boards, or IRBs, now assess and approve research proposals involving human participants. Three ethical principles are generally distinguished. Respect, beneficence, and justice. Respect refers to respect for the participant's autonomy. The decision to participate in research should always be made by participants themselves and should be voluntary. Voluntary consent can be contrasted with coercion. Now, coercion can be subtle. It can consist of offering an extremely large financial reward for participation. If the financial gain is large, then for people who have very little money, it becomes almost impossible not to participate. And the same applies if the benefits consist, for example, of access to an experimental medical treatment that offers hope to terminal cancer patients. A very specific form of coercion happens in most universities that offer psychology programs. In many cases, first-year psychology students are required to participate in a certain number of experiments for course credit. This is presented as part of their training. But alternatives to participation are offered to students, but these generally consist of very unattractive writing assignments. Okay, back to voluntary consent. A decision to voluntarily participate can only be made if all relevant information is available to the participant. A participant should not only give consent, this consent should be well informed. An informed consent form should therefore always be provided and signed beforehand, informing participants about the nature of the study. Of course, revealing the purpose of the study conflicts with the finding that participants can react differently to the experiment if they are aware of the purpose of the study. Often, some form of deception is necessary to control for reactivity and demand characteristics. A review board decides whether this deception is necessary and does not cross ethical boundaries. There are different forms of deception. Deception can occur by omission. The goal of the study is not stated or formulated in very general, vague terms. Deception can also be active. A cover story is provided that's entirely different from the actual purpose of the study. Or participants are given false feedback. For example, participants are provided with a bogus intelligence test and they're told that they scored extremely low. The purpose could be to temporarily lower participants' self-esteem, a manipulation to see how lowered self-esteem affects people's ability, for example, to negotiate a salary. A dangerous consequence of providing such false feedback is what's known as a perseverance effect. This means participants are still affected by the deception even after they're debriefed and the deception is revealed and explained to them. This can happen because participant might believe the researcher is just lying about the deception to make them feel better about their low scores. If deception is deemed necessary and not harmful, then a review board might approve an informed consent form using a cover story combined with an extensive debriefing afterwards. In all studies, participants should be made aware that they can withdraw their consent at any time during or right after a study and ask for their data to be removed. Okay, the second ethical principle is beneficence. Beneficence means that participants should not be harmed. This principle is not as simple as it sounds. Sometimes participation carries a risk of doing harm, but also a potential for doing good. The cost should always be weighed against potential benefits. This applies at the individual level. For example, when a patient participates in a study on a new cancer treatment, that's a potential cure, but also has severe side effects. But the cost-benefit analysis also applies on a broader level. For example, for all cancer patients, or even society as a whole. The missed benefits of not doing a study, not learning about a new cure for cancer, or the cause for a societal problem should also be weighed. A type of harm that's perhaps less obvious is the invasion of a participant's privacy. Participants should know what their data will be used for and who will have access to it. Anonymity of data should only be promised if identifying information is deleted, and not even the researcher can retrace the data back to the participant. 
Otherwise, a researcher should be clear about the confidentiality of the data. Who will have access and what will it be used for? Issues concerning confidentiality and use of the data are becoming more important as more and more of our behavior is recorded automatically. Finally, the third principle of justice means that the costs and benefits of research should be divided reasonably, fairly, and equally over potential participants. Specific groups should not be given preferential treatment, and reversely, vulnerable groups should not be exploited, as was the case in the Tuskegee study.